My name is Eric White, and uh, I've been in the roofing industry of about 30 years, going about 30 years. I started off in the manufacturing side of the business for a company called Tremco, uh, which is based out of Cleveland. It was a direct sales organization. Um, from there, I moved on to the contracting side and sales, actually, after Katrina, because we just weren't set up to be storm chasers. And uh, my contractors didn't need me anymore to sell for them because they had a lot of roofs to do after Katrina. Um, in fact, funny story, the, the Friday before um, Katrina, um, I had just signed a contract with the, to re-roof with Tremco as a manufacturer, the um, hospital for the VA center. And that Friday, we signed the contracts. Went to a father-daughter dance on Saturday night and uh, met some of my friends and they said, hey, you know, how are things going? I said, great, we just made a great new sale with the VA hospital and he said, well, I, I don't know if it's gonna happen because we got a hurricane coming and at that time, no one knew anything. It's Saturday, like when you found out Saturday night. And of course, Sunday is when Katrina <laughs> hit that gulf and hit that, uh, came fast and furious. And uh, so that didn't ever happen, but full circle, I just went and did an inspection and present an inspection for an architect on that hospital about two months ago and same looks it was like it was like a ghost town some of the things inside just almost like time stopped there was papers and things on there um that did so did a lot of roofing after katrina did a lot of experience i've done a lot of inspections over time um, my company uh white heron metals um is a manufacturer distribution company and a little bit about us because uh, i'm gonna plug us but uh, John Heron um, is a major shareholder and partner um, in this particular business um, as well. But uh, our mission is basically to become a known expert in architectural metal components. I'm very well known as an expert in the roofing industry. I have a company called White Prince in which I do consulting. I do legal cases, um, qualified Orleans and Jefferson Parish as an expert for testimony um, in the roofing world. Uh, we want to achieve this by social media, doing these presentations as we're doing, um, because I, I believe everyone deserves a quality roof, and unfortunately, they don't always get it. So, uh, so the history of roofing in New Orleans. Um, the history of roofing in New Orleans, back when New Orleans was originally found, most of the roofs were actually shake. And it was the fires, if you go ahead and move on, to the fires of 1789, 88, excuse me, and 1794. I don't know how familiar you guys are with this. Um, but there were two major fires in New Orleans, 1788 and 1794, uh, burned down pretty much two thirds of the city. And after that was trying to rebuild, another fire started up in 1794 and burned down another third of the city. Um, and so they decided at the time, as often happens when catastrophes happen, code kicks in. That's kind of the birthplace of code and what happens. They said, okay, no more wood shakes. We're going to slate, and that's why you have the roofs you have in New Orleans today. Slate, clay, concrete, and those type of metals, and those uh, type of roof systems because they're non-combustible um, due to that effect. So those were very pivotal, pivotal times in our city and why we had the codes we have today. So there are types of roof in New Orleans in the French Quarter. There are two types of roof systems. You got low slope and you got steep slope. And within those, you have all of these types within the French Quarter as well. Um, but in low slope, you have built up roofing, which is BUR, the acronym. You have modified roofs, which is a piggybacks on top of BUR. And it's kind of when manufacturers decided to say, hi, how can we make more money by let's combine the asphalt with the felt so that way we can make more money. Then you have metal, which is also can be a low slope roof. And then we have single plies, and there's an alphabet of different single plies out there. And on a steep slope side, we have slate, which is very common in the New Orleans French Quarter. We have concrete and clay, kind of the same category. Uh, then we have metal and steep slope as well. And then we have synthetics. The French Quarter and the VCC, um, which has a great, and, and I know you're a big part of that, and I'm gonna give you kudos, because it is, I go to that, that site all the time. But also the, um, the actual paperwork that tells you what you can and can't do is based on the historical significance of the building. So that's a big part of what you can and can't do. But every one of those roofs are in the quarter, believe it or not. Um, and again, I will say I've even seen one building actually what's not supposed to be in a quarter, shingles. But I've seen, 
a couple of them out there like that. So let's talk about roots and channels. So we got single plies. You have an alphabet soup of single plies. You have TPOs, which is a thermoplastic oval in its chemical name. You have EPDMs. You have PVCs, um, different types of membranes. I'll pass around some of these around. If you are going to put a steep or low slope roof on with a single ply material, um, and you're using a single ply like this, like a TPO or a PVC, the DCC definitely likes to have the grays. They don't like the bright whites. Um, I was involved in a project on Decatur in which we put this particular product on a roof out there. So y'all want to feel that and pass it around. Pass those around for you. Um, believe it or not, this is a, another, here's a green one actually that's involved with the job that on Delgado uh, for their baseball diamond. Um, but believe it or not, PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride, which in my opinion is a much better roof single ply system than TPO. It's kind of like beta and VHS. Beta was a much better format, but VHS won the day through marketing. Um, I think these are kind of the same. PVC, back about ICAPAL, about in the 70s, um, had a PVC product that failed miserably, and architects have a very long memory in the city. And what had happened, the plastics baked out of the product, and there was tons of it down in Terrebonne Parish in the school system. And when it froze one year, that material became very rigid, and when someone stepped on it, it shattered. So it was the major lawsuit, architects heard about it, everyone got scared of PVC. But actually, PVC is a better product in the South than TPO. TPO is a better product for the North. And that's simply because of the temperature differential. It's a lot more fluid on the PVCs than the TPOs, and it's a lot stiffer, so it's a lot more flex in the hot summer months that it can move. So PVC, much better roof. Um, you don't see a lot of it. Modifieds are another type of roof um, that you see in the French Quarter too. And, and is any, people know what modified is? Or why they call it modified? A um, couple of projects I was involved with, we did some what's called peel and stick modifieds on Charter Street. Um, it was high rises because you cannot torch in the French Quarter for obvious reasons. Because if it goes up, it may all go up, okay? So torch is not allowed. So what can you do when you have a low slope roof that you need to put material on, you can use a peel and stick. And the technology has come a long way. In fact, we involved in this project, we put this roof on uh, right before Ida, about six months before Ida. It fared very, very well. So you do have some good technology out there for the peel and stick roof systems. Modified just basically means that it's taken part of the asphalt or the waterproofing and blended it with the actual sheet, which gives it the stability. And then they add the granules on top for the reflective and the sacrificial surface. So that's your modifieds. If y'all want to pass that around, feel that. That product, product happens to be certain teed, but you got all your major manufacturers make that particular product. Then we have metal, which is my um, specialty. Metal, you have standard seams, and you have exposed fastener systems. And those are the two main types of roofs you have. They do not like in a quarter R panels. Our panels are exposed fasten systems that have, you know, fasteners that will, sooner or later, will leak. They may for cover and shed. If you want to put a good metal roof on, you want to put a standard seam or a lock seam. On low slope, you put a lock seam and you actually solder the joints with copper or a galvanized material. Um, and those are the only two materials you can solder. It's going to be galvanized and copper. And so if you want to re redo your roof, how do we know which one we can use? We have to go to the DCC and ask them? Correct. And in other words, you are, if you're going to partner up with your contractor, you know, look at your contractor, see what type of roof you have now existing. That's a big part of it, what you have now. You can go on their website and designate through addresses to find out what color your building is. Now, I don't, I'm not an expert in the VCC colors, but Brooke probably could tell you better than I could. But there are different colors that denote the significance, and I think purple is probably the highest. So purple is, is the highest, and I've done a lot of work with the VCC over the years um, as, you know, doing inspections and things of that nature. But yeah, but that, that will designate what type of roof system you can put on there. Typically, they like to put like and kind back on, on the roofs, so that's the thing. But in the metal world, you can use exposed fastener systems. Um, a couple of more, you can use what's called a corrugated or an S panel, which is just that wavy panel. 
And then they also have a five V crimp. And as the name says, within that panel, you have five small V crimps that go on there. Uh, but there are exposed fasteners. And it's not a matter if, it, it, in my opinion, it will leak because you just have a coefficient of movement that, you know, as it cools and things, metal can move up to an eighth inch or to a quarter inch a day. Um, and so I think, I think John was telling me a story one time when he put actually a grip edge on a building, came back the next day, he thought actually someone had ripped it off, but it was from the contraction that when they put it on, you know, and lesson learned, you know, don't put it on so tight in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, that can happen. Moving on, so let's go on to the steep slope. We got clay and concrete. You move on to clay. Clay, um, the big name in, in clay, as you see mostly, is Ludowici. Um, and Ludowici is a major manufacturer of, of clay tiles, and that's pretty much you know, the dominant force in this part of the world, you know, in this region. Um, excellent, excellent product. Okay, it's been around for centuries. In fact, um, if you go over in Europe, most of your roofs are clay tile. Even in Japan, most of your roofs are clay tile, and they last for you know up to 200 years. Costly, but you know it's hopefully it's the last roof if put on correctly. Will be the last roof you ever put on, you know, if it's done correctly. Um, but interesting fact: the way you tell the quality of a clay tile is through sound. So you can actually, you should have a little ring, so you can tell if a tile has become saturated with water or oversaturated with, with it, it doesn't make a kind of a ring sound. So I think I found a couple of products, like this is the French tile by Ludovici, and you got your Spanish tile. So if you, if you clank them together, you'll hear a little ring, almost like a bell. So if you hear a, a clank, and this is just a French style, and I'll pass these around if you don't want to, but they're, they're quite heavy. You can hear the, you know, the difference, and they hear that little bell. And then if it's really dead, you'll hear that bell sound, that ring. And that's kind of the, tell, yeah, you hear that, that bell sound. So if you want to see what your, this sounds like, and then it's like you got these styles here, and you know, all these are little itchy, but they've just been, you hear that sound difference? It's just like dead. It's almost like a knock versus that bell sound. The clay tile has been around for probably one of the first roof systems put on there, you know, going back to the uh, even Roman days. Y'all want to see these? No? Yes? No? That's flat tile. They, they're quite heavy. Anywhere from twelve to twenty-four dollars a square foot could be more. Um, simply, that, a lot of that has to do in the French Quarter with logistics. And it's just the harder to get to something if you have to manhandle stuff, you know, from a carriage house in the back to bring it up to the front. You know, it, it's, it's a lot more labor intensive. So labor is a big factor in dealing with these products. Um, although I will say, Ludovic is quite proud of their products. I did the relay involved in the relay for the Greek church after Katrina for the roofer to put it on, uh, didn't do it correctly. So we had to rip it off and then put it back on. And then during that process, there was a um, half moon um, in the front of the church, at the front. And uh, they asked me to get a pricing together for that. And I priced it out through Ludovici, and I, I wanna say that was about 150, it was, it was maybe half a square, which is a square is, is basically a 10 by 10 area in roofing so it's 100 square feet is a square roofing and that must have been maybe 25 square feet and those two little half circles cost about $25,000 just simply because they had to come out and grade them and they had to cut each individual tile to make that grade and I said I could put it in copper two or three times <laughs> But they wanted, they wanted that look, so they decided to go with it. I mean, the VCC cares about, and again, the architectural value in, in, sa in saving what the architectural look was historically for the you know, quarter. And, that, and that's, in fact, the second old, oldest organization in the country um, to do that, that they passed legislation because they almost lost it because they started, you know, I think in the, I want to say the 20s, 
they started tearing down a lot of buildings because um, as, as slavery ended, they, they, a lot of people moved out and started living in an uptown area and, and the plantation owners that, that moved out to that area, to the uptown area. And so New Orleans became really a, and I love history, and I'm no history expert, but I do love it. It came really a, a, for the lower class and, and, and a lot of poor people were left in the city. And so uh, as they started rebuilding, revitalizing, they started tearing stuff down. And some people sort of said, hey, wait, before we just kind of clear everything out. So that's kind of why the VCC is created. So anything, and I've learned this lesson, anything that touches the outside air, I learned this early, early on in my lesson uh, in my career, anything that touches the outside air is their domain. And in the inside, they don't, they don't even, I don't think they even look um, in the inside. But I have been told also that they actually have arresting powers because they vantated. Except for when it's city. So, well, so the VCC, well, exactly. Yeah, the VCC is, gonna, is going to building inspect the integrity of your historic structure from like an architectural history and preservation standpoint, but they are not your home inspectors. Yeah. So you're going to have to source And they're not roof inspectors them. either. Yeah. So, and I, and I give you another, another example of that, and this is another presentation I do, and I'm not going to divert too much, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. But Fortified, a lot of people are hearing about Fortified lately. Don't worry about it in a quarter because you're never going to have it because it's, not, it's nothing in the quarter that's going to match up to what Fortified wants. But with that said, Fortified is, was created by the insurance companies through the IBHS, which is the Institute of Business, Health, and Safety. They created the Fortified roof system, which is good and great for the insurance companies. Not so good, in my opinion, for the consumers, okay? And I, what I mean by that is that they're gonna seal your deck as part of the standards now, and that is also the new code as of 2023 for IBC and IRC 2021, which we have adopted with amendments for the state of Louisiana. They say you have to now seal your deck, which means you can do that one of four ways. You either use tape on your seams of your plywood, you ice and water shield, which is a peel and stick material underneath as an underlayment, or you put foam on your joints of your underlayment on the underside of your plywood, or you do two layers of 30 pound felt or two layers of synthetic felt, which they just passed to do with a special nailing pattern. The reason they want to do that because insurance companies have found that 90% of the water uh, comes through the cracks of the decking. So when you lose your skin or lose your surfacing or your you know cover you know when that blows off during a storm all that water gets in well now with the new codes you have a sealed deck it doesn't happen and i can tell you that my insurance and i live in metairie but my insurance went up 135 percent over the last two years and you still got to pay more to do a sealed deck but to your point is the fact that yeah but to your point is the fact that code nor does Fortified care how that shingle is nailed. They just care they want to stop the water from getting in because they pay less of a claim. So now your roof blows off, you have a 2 to 5% deductible. Insurance company says, great, thank you very much. No water inside. You can still live there too, by the way, so I don't have to replace you, even though it's 112 degrees outside. You still got to live in that house because there's no problems. Secondly, eh, we got to have that roof redone because we can't insure you if you don't. And that roof's going to cost you about $20,000. Your deductible is 18. Here's two. Good luck. Have a nice day. And that's where you're standing, you know. So to that point, VCC, and so it's due diligence on the homeowners to make sure that you hire and get with a good contractor that does that kind of roofing. Or also you can hire third parties. I know I do a lot of that too as well, you know, inspections, doing a process, bringing people together. So, but anyway, I don't want to divert too much. Moving on. Slate. I love slate. I think slate is the most beautiful roof there is. And I can't, I can deny it. But it's, it's a product that can last many, 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 many years. Um, but moving on to slate, that can cost anywhere from $15 to $25 a square foot. Slate does have a hard slate and it has a soft slate. Hard slates will last longer. In the slate colors, you have different purples. This is actually the uh, rendition of the, um, I think, the uh, bar on Toulouse. Blacksmith, yeah, it's one of the oldest buildings in New Orleans. Um, but uh, it's a slate roof up there, and they have a variegated purple and some greens and stuff. And the way those colors come out of the ground, the, the deeper they are, the lighter they are. So your darker colors are closer to the surface, 
which makes those slate less expensive because it's less work to get to. So the product itself is less expensive when you go with the darker slates. Um, also, slates have hardened scales, so you do have quality slates. There was an influx of some slate from China for a little bit. Um, quality was not there. And when I say quality, it's because it's a metamorphic rock. So what happens is you get iron ores or different products in that slate, it, a lot of impurities, which makes it fail prematurely. So if you see rust stains, not a good slate, not a good sign. Seeing rust stains coming out your slate, that that's a time that, hey, you may have a bad slate because they'll start getting brittle. How do you specify that you're getting a quality slate? What's the right specification for that? You know, I would talk to an architect, but it's SH1 is, is one of the designations for a you know, type of slate. Um, the size, 3 8 to, I think, quarter inch, 3 8 to a half inch in thickness. So there's a set, you can look up online and say, hey, give me a set of specifications, CSI format, three-part format for a good quality slate. You can go to any slate um, companies like Vermont Slate Company out of Savannah, Georgia. They can provide you some specifications and installations. And that also relates to your, um, your hardness for your hail hits. And of course, we don't get a lot of hail there, but we have. And in 99, we did have a big hail storm that came through here. So, but moving on, um, and then actually, let me talk about um, we got concrete. Okay, let's, let's go to metal. Metal is another, another one of my, uh, well, don't pass around some slate because this is actually a Vermont slate right here by the gray green color, some samples. Um, metal again can be low slope or steep slope. Um, so if you get low slope, you definitely want to have, and a low slope is defined by from a 1 8 and 12 to a 2 12. 2 12 and above is considered steep slope. So uh, with that, if you're going to do a metal roof, I highly recommend stand and seam, which is a hidden fastener system. Okay, um, the French Quarter they like the metal roofs that are made on site. So basically, they make you know, clips, you install clips, and then they bend on site. We can feel for them on site, and then put that on the roof, one inch stand and seams, um, either made out of a soft malleable material like copper, or galvanized. Uh, copper is obviously the product of choice because if it's long lasting. Um, life of the actual roof so galvanized unfortunately i think the usda kind of crippled it a little bit because they took a lot of the good qualities it's kind of like asbestos it was a great product but not so great for the health when it became friable um, but a great product it, overall as a binder and that's what it does and unfortunately that's what happened with mesothelioma because it came in and when it became friable hooked to the lungs and created problems but metal um, is, is Lysand, you wanna go to the next slide? Um, is a, um, anywhere from eight to $30, and I, that's a big range. But your, your 5B crimps, for example, very easy to put on exposed fastener systems. You know, on the low end, you know, the product about our panels, and I know that we don't hear that word in the French Quarter, but 5B crimps, you're looking at about, material cost about a buck 50 a square foot to a buck 80 a square foot, depending on the type of metal. And then you get up to the standard seams, you're looking at four, up to 420 a square foot on the type of material in the metal, you know, copper. You're looking at, um, in fact, I just priced out uh, a copper standard seam roof, one inch historical roof uh, for a church. And I think that price was, I wanna say right around $12 a square foot on, on the copper standard seam roof. But it'll last way longer than I'll be around. Uh, so 30 to 100 years, those are some pictures in the background that I've done drone. I am a drone pilot as well, um, so I do a lot of inspections and so I can drone uh, properties as well. So moving on. Synthetic. Talked about the hailstorm of 99, okay? I don't understand why people would go with synthetic. It's not tremendous cost savings at all. Um, and unfortunately, we've had a lot of past failures. Um, we had a product called Lamorite, which actually was specified and I was a consultant on, installed on Holy Name of Jesus. And I came back after it failed and had to fight for the warranty and had it redone with another synthetic, Lamorite, which is a good product, but it's like if you can, Use your natural products. You know the history. You know it's there. It's not going, you know, so it, you just don't know. But after the hailstorm, you had two products that came into the French Quarter. 
that installed the lot after the 99 hailstorm. And that was Fire Free. If anybody's heard of that name, Fire Free. It's a Canadian company and there's still tons of it around here. It's crazy. But it, it was a concrete cementitious type tile, slate looking, and it absorbs so much water that it becomes so brittle. It's irreparable. If you even step foot on it, it'll crack and crumble. Even on its own, it will just fall and, you know, on its own. And unfortunately, when you have these disasters, you get a lot of people come in that don't do things properly. People were nailing these things with galvanized nails, you know, and things of like that instead of using copper or stainless. You know, you're putting on a supposedly a 50 year roof and using a 10 year product to nail it. So a lot of failures with those. So that's a bad one. And also Lamorite. And this is actually, I had a sample. This is, this one's kept in the doors, but this is actually one. And this is a failed product. This was made by Tamco. And that's another thing. When a UV hits it, um, a roof I did in Mattery, Whole Foods. Uh, and it's another one that was that particular product that I had to fight for. And Tamco, actually, they did a pretty good job of standing up behind the product and replacing the product at no charge because it was a ma major failure of a product. But that got real brittle, cracked, and would just, you know, as you know, time goes on, just fall off the roofs. And it became a safety hazard for Whole Foods. And that's why they asked me to respect it. I did all the legwork and all that for them to get that roof redone. Are there any synthetic slates that are My opinion, no. And, that, and again, it's just an opinion, but I think some plastic companies may argue with me, but no. There's a place for every product. You know, there's no panacea out there that says, okay, this is the best roof in the world. I never do it except for Kotor Pitch. Uh, and I love Kotor Pitch. It's a great product. But it's, you know, it's antiquated. It's old. And it's considered now class one carcinogen. Um, but I am still here, and I use a lot of it. Uh, but it is the class one carcinogen. Um, but you know, and then of course gravel became after the new, I led a team of architects, engineers to the state capitol to do a rebuild right campaign um, when we had the opportunity because we used to operate on the Southern Building Code. And a lot of us really felt the IBC was a much better code system. So we have helped to integrate and I spoke in front of the Ways and Means Committee to talk about changing to from the SBC to the IBC code because it was just a better code overall. And of course, gravel is used in cold tar pitch because there's a melting point of 70 degrees. So unfortunately, in fact, I'm going to divert a little bit, but in fact, because I love the history of roofing, they used to actually build bellies in roofs to insulate them in the summertime. And so they would insulate them with, pour, put water on top of it, because on a molecular level, cold tar pitch is actually heavier than water. But it, it would melt at 70 degrees, so if they found out if you put any kind of slope on it, it would just slide right off the building. And so a lot of buildings that were cold tar pitch now move to asphalt, and BUR have that dead level area of ponding, which can be problematic as well, because now you can't have any kind of water sitting more than 48 hours on a low slope roof, because it will shorten its life overall, because it acts like a solvent. Because just like you take that glass of water, and you put oil or vegetable or any kind of oil, it all rises to the top. And that's what happens in a modified system when the water sits on it, the oils in that asphalt all rise to the top and it acts like a solvent on it. So it weakens the life. But moving on, uh, yeah, very inconsistent. And, that, and that's my answer to synthetics. You just don't know. You, you just don't know. I mean, because nothing's out there that's lasted like, we're a very young country, you know, compared to Europe, Asia, but they, they're, you know, four or 5,000 year old buildings that, that have the roofs on them that they've had, you know. Shingles is another one. They don't even sell shingles in, in Europe and Asia because they consider it such a throwaway roof. It's cheap. It, it's just a throwaway roof. Yes, sir. Do they have synthetics that are like concrete? Yes. Well, I mean, concrete's kind of a natural product too because it's gravel, rock, and it's a mixture of stuff. But yes, but yeah, if you want to, I don't know if you define it as synthetic or not, but it is a composite material that's, you know, I mean, this, this is concrete here, which is the Hector Ridge tiles that you see a lot in the quarter. Uh, concrete tiles have been around for, you know, is acceptable in quarter because it's been around for eons. Um, I think the barrel tiles, I don't know this to be fact, but I'll make this story up because it sounds like a good story. They had so many Spanish tiles out there that I think people kind of used the, an excess of those barrel tiles as ridge tiles, just as a decorative, you know, to set the roof off, you know, for an architectural feature. Um, and that's why, because you don't see that anywhere else in the country. 
when you see those barrel tiles sitting on top of a shingle roof or a you know a um, slate roof you see the art now you see the, a lot of these too as well you know this architectural um, concrete tiles how do they compare weight wise and does that make a difference on your particular yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that, and again, like, I'll, and I, I'm thank you for the question because it does bring you back because there is a time and place for everything. If you want the look of that synthetic, uh, you know, the slate look, th that is one benefit of synthetics that they're all lighter weight than natural because a natural slate is going to call it right, weigh anywhere from six to seven hundred pounds per square. So you have to have structural integrity. Now, most of the structures in the French Quarter are built to withstand that type of weight load, or that dead load on a roof. Residential roofing, you know, in, in the suburbs, not so much. You know, there's a lot more two by fours, and then even those two by fours are not true two by fours anymore, because they're three and a half by one and a half, and they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, but yeah, but that is a benefit, so if you do want that look, that is one, you know, reason to go with a synthetic, because it is a lighter product than, you know, than some real slate. But if your house can, put it on slate because, and again, there's not a lot of big cost savings in the difference between the products. Coatings, you got urethanes, acrylics, and silicones. Um, I put this in a big part of, of maintenance. That's actually, this roof is actually um, um, the, I, is it Bienville or the Rue, Rue Chalet, 1234 Rue Chalet a Hotel that was there. Um, had a big modified roof on it. Kind of demo. So we did. I did an infrared scan on the roof. We removed some wet areas. We added some drainage, and then we put a new coating on to give it some longer last lifing. Coatings are made to basically extend the life of a roof. It's not made to make a bad roof good, and it won't. So make sure that the roof design is is you know just extend that life. So it is a window of opportunity to do a coating. So I tell a lot of people, do not think it's a panacea. It's not going to make it. a lot of people try to sell it like that. Oh, we'll put the coating on, it'd be all good and dandy. Well, no, it don't work like that. If you've got any kind of moisture in that roof, it will pop that coating off. And a lot of time, guys just don't prep properly in coating. And that's everything. It's like painting your walls. You know, if you don't prep properly, it's not going to stick. And you've got to clean it real well. But they, you do have the urethanes and acrylics and silicones. I'm not a big fan of acrylics in the family uh, because acrylics have very small windows where they work well in high humid clients, climates rather. The climate here, very humid, chance of rain. Um, the instructions tell you don't put down if you have a chance of rain within three hours. Well, it's been dry this year, but typically in New Orleans, if you go three hours without a rainfall, you, you're in good shape, but it'll wash right off. And I had to add another valuable lesson. I used to do every post office in the state of Louisiana as a, as a consultant in with Tremco. And uh, we did a acrylic and a modified on a post office and it rained. And uh, if, you ever, if you ever have a spillage on a federal facility, it's very entertaining because, I mean, they had the FBI out there, the USDA out there, the EPA out there, and everybody's in white suits. <laughs> and it's a water-based product, so it was, uh, but yeah, I don't like acrylics anymore, so I don't, I don't deal with them, so. But those are great products. They help extend the life of your roof. Moving on. Maintenance. Big proponent of maintenance. The NRCA recommends two inspections per year that you want to do on your roof, okay? Your roof, like any other part, or any other kind of moving equipment, it moves, okay? Things move, things crack, especially on commercial roofs, but even on steep slopes, things do move. You got metal, you got wood, you got felt, you got clay, you got mastics, you got membranes. All those materials expand and contract at different rates. So we may have a 120 degrees, or at least it feels like sometimes out there, 120 degrees on a roof. And then all of a sudden you get that afternoon thunderstorm. So 120 degrees, rains, you have what's called thermal shock, and it'll actually cool that roof down by 34 degrees within a matter of six minutes. And all of a sudden all that materials, so those things move. So you want to make sure that you know you want to certain check certain areas for those type of movements to take care of them before they become major problems. Another big thing about maintenance, which I, and again, out of sight, out of mind, most people don't. I try to encourage it. You know, just, you don't want to have maybe a major like, inspection, maybe every five to seven years by a professional. 
Um, but you know, pretty much you can do the inspections yourself through a set of binoculars. You know, if you don't want to get that, drones are a great way to use them. You know, especially recreational. You know, you only need a license right now, I believe, if you are using them for professional services. So if you get a little cheap drone, you can, and they got great pictures. You know, you can take some great pictures of your roof um, just to see. Make sure you got no cracks. Depending on the type of roof system you have, just you know, a couple of times a year. I like to call it before and after hurricane season. Now, I like to do that simply because as a homeowner, you want to do those pictures before and after because now you have proof of what my roof would look like before the storm happened. And if you have a storm come through, now you have, okay, this is what it looks like now. You know, so you have some evidence because it's you bear that burden of proof to show the insurance company what damage is caused by the storm. Uh, roof and expansion contracts, so weather conditions, heat and cooling, like I talked about, thermal shock. Um, and the lifespan of your roof is directly related to how often it gets inspected. <coughs> because again, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, now, not often we do get those freezes, but we do. So if you do have some movement, water rains, and we get a freeze and rain, that ice expands, contracts. Um, and as it melts, it, you know, it causes issues and concerns. So doing those inspections will help get you better off because it's better to, you know, it's a pound of cure. What is it that saying? Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it adds exactly in roofing. How much does an inspection cost? Um, I mean, if you do them yourself, it's free. But, um, but typically, like if you're doing like, it depends on what the inspection, like my services as a consultant, um, and I'm a Hague certified engineer consultant for damage, and then I'm studying also to be an RRC, a registered roof consultant through IBEC. Um, but typically consultants are anywhere from, you know, from 75 to 95 an hour. And it depends on what you want, you know, you know, I guess if I do a residential inspection, just like for a house sale, they said, hey, well, you need a professional to come out here and do an inspection. Usually I charge like 10 cents a square foot. You know, it's like a couple hundred bucks, 300 bucks, you know, to do the oral inspection. And the more detailed, you know, the more we have to charge time-wise. Um, causes and identify for premature roof failures. A big one, 47%. This is an interesting statistic. I think it's eight, don't, don't fact check me on this, but it's high. 80% of all construction litigation deals with roofing and waterproofing. 80% of construction litigation, okay? So unfortunately, insurance companies, condos make up 80% of that construction because there's so many owners and stuff. So you get a lot of contractors won't even do condos and things of that nature. So that's something just to be wary of when you run into a condo association. Um, and but 47% is due to poor workmanship. Why you have a failure of a roof before its life expectancy. 47% is due to workmanship. 16% is due to poor design. Uh, and that's just when I say design, I talk about roof slope if you're dealing with a you know, structure where you have a flat roof type scenario or a built up commercial roof, um, that kind of thing. Um, I just was involved in re-roofing the center courtyard for the 411 Rampart, um, the Church of Guadalupe on, on Rampart. We just finished up that job and uh, it, was, it was, it was a poor design. And so we went in there and I redesigned it, re you know, the slope. I caution you, I'm not an architect, so I very loosely use the word design. I encourage. <laughs> it's different drainage. So I look at the drainage and, and got it, put that on there. And we put a modified roof on that building. 9% um, uh, due to faulty materials and weathering. And there's your synthetics, unfortunately. 8% uh, due to the mechanical damages. Um, sometimes other trades don't care too much about the roof. Now, I will say this, I love roofing. And sometimes people say, well, you care more about roofs than some doctors care about their patients. And, and, and it's because it, I want to make sure, I tell people all the time, the roofer should be the last one off the roof on new construction because you don't want any other fingers being pointed so I can do a final inspection and it should nice and clean, nice and pretty. 3% due to foot traffic, and that's just normally um, wear and tear. Um, a lot of time that's just, you know, balconies. A lot of times people are trying to turn their roofs into pools and patios and the like so th those kind of things are not good or sometimes they're not designed to be that but they use it as that because they go out their window and hang out on the roof um, there's a condo on roll street i used to have to go always because the guy who lives there goes out that front window and hangs out on the roof and cracks all the sleep 
and they wonder why they have leaks. <clears throat> Roofing contractors, this is going to be your best friend in how, this, uh, how I recommend when you are having to do a roof. This is a very expensive proposition doing a roof in the French Quarter. Very expensive. Um, so you want to make sure you're only doing it once in your lifetime. So if you do have property, you want to make sure you have a good, solid contractor that's familiar with the type of roof you decide to put on or what the VCC allows you to put on. Um, I always say get the three job referrals for that type of roof, not your Uncle Harry, not your Uncle Aunt Billy, not, I want your last three jobs that you've done. And they should be able to provide last three jobs because you just don't know. Look, this is mom and pops, you don't know what's going on in someone's life, you know, Sometimes a lot of guys use subs, and you don't know what, you know what subs come and gone. And you know, it may have been a storm, and a lot of guys left, you know, went to Florida, working in Florida as subcontractors. So, I mean, a lot of that does happen in the roofing industry. So you want to make sure, hey, what was your last three jobs? I want to talk to some of those people. Give me three people I can talk to to make sure they were happy with, you know. So setting expectations, good paperwork, you know, good contracts, keeps everyone happy. Uh, proper insurance. You want to make sure they have proper roofing insurance, you know, because someone falls. If you hire a contractor, it does not have license, it's not contract, you become the general contractor of record. And if someone gets hurt while doing that, it could potentially cost you your house because your insurance does not cover you to be a general contractor. So if someone does fall, and unfortunately there is a death um, or a major injury, um, they can sue you if they're not covered with the proper liability insurance. Workman's comp insurance protects the company from being sued. It protects the homeowner from being come and sued because Louisiana law states that if you have a proper workman's comp that you cannot sue for anything but what workman's comp provides. Okay, so that, that's very important uh, that you have proper. Look it up. The state has a great website and you can do an app. Look it up. They give them their, they give them, get their number from them, make sure it's insurance. Make sure you get the insurance from their insurance company. Like guys, you know, sometimes they're on a little unscrew. We've earned our reputation sometimes, honestly. So sometimes, you know, you, I've seen guys who use someone else's paperwork and hand it to them as their insurance, you know. So do your due diligence, you know, protect yourself. Um, Can I add to that? Yes. So I have a contractor and um, insurance it's very tricky. Like you can, they'll, they'll provide general liability and all that kind of stuff, but there are times where some insurance companies will not um, cover in roofing. So just because they have an insurance, a, 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 a certificate of insurance, it doesn't mean that the, the roofing is covered. So you have, to, you have to call those insurance companies to make sure that they are covered for roofing work. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's yeah, true. and it is very, very, very true. Very true. And in fact, you know, it, it, um, roofing insurance is the most expensive of the workman's comp there is. That's why a lot of general contractors won't do the roofing work or say, you know, won't cover it in the insurance because it's so expensive. And once some people get labeled as roofers, sometimes the insurance companies go, well, we're going to charge you all roofing, <laughs> even though you may be doing other things, you know, painting and, and things of that nature, you know, um, construction or carpentry companies do that but you do have because they charge you per dollar so it's like maybe sometimes like 40 cents on the dollar 50 cents on the dollar for for percentage wise for covering roofing where carpentry may be 20 cents on the dollar so for every dollar you pay that employee that's the insurance part of it that costs you and then of course on top of that you have your umbrella policies general liability you got your auto insurance and everything else. So it can get quite costly um, to be a contractor. Some new products I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Um, as White Heron Metals, we are distributors and you asked about synthetics. So great product. Um, metal is a great product. Now this is not something that's used in the French Quarter, but you may have friends that don't live in the French Quarter and they want that tile look. Vic West, uh, True Nature, offers different metal type tile systems that have been passed for wind uplift as far as pressure testing. Um, and it's a metal tile and then, oh, you know what? I didn't bring it in, darn it. But I did have a sample. It's a very pretty looking tile, um, but you can see it on our website. Ready Slate, Vermont company. This is made by Coupa. We are a distributor for Ready Slate and Vermont um, as a distributor. 
And um, that's a cool new product. We've done a couple of times. You can go to the next slide and show some of the pictures that we've done. Um, these are the true nature tiles here. These are the metal slates. Um, I did a lot of research and looking for a manufacturer I wanted to represent. And I uh, found this to be the most aesthetically pleasing, number one. And number two, it's one of the only two machines in the world can make this type of tile. One's in Canada and the other one's in Austria. And one of the biggest things, there's a little, I'm going to go over here and look up here, but there's a little lip that causes a track. There's only two machines can make that lip that sticks out a little bit further. Otherwise, there's things you've got to do to cut and bend and caulk on these metal slates. So it's a very unique. But that's some of the uh, pitches. That's okay. But that's some of the pitches that look like some finished products that contractors have done. There are no actual products that are approved in a quarter. Because they don't approve products carte blanche. They don't approve anything. You present what you're going to do, and they tell you, OK, that's OK. So they won't carte blanche just, just approve anything, because you've got the different building colors. Um, but no, this one particularly is not. But this, like I said, that's why I preface by saying you may have some friends outside the quarter that want that look. But it's got that lightweight, and it's, it's got that long lasting. It's 50 years. It's a metal. It's a proven product. It's not plastic. It's metal. Moving on. That's just some of the projects that they have. Um, this product I'm excited about. Now this is a product that is, can be potentially the future. This is a real slate. Now this is dirty, so, because then it's heavy. But this product is made by um, Koopa. Now the only downside to this product, it only comes in this color. Um, but I'll pass it around. But it's got seven tile, and this is only two, but it's real slate. It's put on a modified with an EPDM gasket on top. What that allows you to do in slate roofing, depending on the slope on the pitch, you have a head lap. And anything less than a 12-12, you're supposed to have a four inch head lap. Well, unfortunately, a lot of times they don't put it on like that. They use a lot of times they use three inch. And that's really disheartening when I have to go do inspections because a homeowner asked me to come and do inspection. And I know it's a 6-12 pitch and they got a three inch head lap, and I go, mm, it's not put on right. That's expensive roof I have to tear off. And I had to do that a couple of times to write a report. Roofer was not very happy with me. So natural slate may cost anywhere from seven to 850 a square. As a distributor, I sell that particular product at 550 a square. It allows you to do a two inch head lap, which thanks. And if you go to the next slide, this is some of the you know, unique features about it. This is one roof that was done. Actually, um, Newark's did, John's company did this roof here um, in the French Quarter on Royal Street. Uh, it's a great roof you know, to see, be able to see the product itself that, we, that they put on there. And then there's another company, Reroof America had another product, because it's a relatively new product, but we've got a couple now, two or three and a quarter, that we've done with that particular product. But it's real slate. It's an SH1 slate, so it's, you know, it's a hard slate. Um, so it's, it's got all the benefits of slate, yet use less product. Use less product. Correct. And that's some of the pictures of the ready slate going on in that. And that's it. And they got any questions or? So the, the, the price point is about the same? 550 is cheaper. 550 a square. It's cheaper and you lose, I mean, use less product. Yeah, and it's, and it's an easy install. And it, it, the, the lines are marked, if you look close, you that two inch lines are marked already. Seven. Seven tiles across, yes. <clears throat> you got a leak, how do you fix it? Depends what kind of roof. What, what kind of roof? Uh, Steep slope? Steep slope. Slate, tile? It's not slate, it's a tile, but it looks like. Like a concrete tile? Concrete tile. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is basically, you know, if you don't, especially being a steep slope, you don't want to have to walk on slate of tile if you don't have to. So you definitely want to set up, in, from an inspection standpoint, ladders that can bear the load. So you want to hook on that ridge or something so you don't have to actually step on it, okay? Um, you can do one of two things. You can do a water test. Find out. Start from the low point and work your way up, putting water on the roof. I've gone as far as they, and actually setting up just a um, sprinkler system, the osculating. Just lock it on, let it sit there for a couple hours. If I don't see anything, I may move it up, turn it back a little bit, let it go a little higher up on that roof, turn it back, let it go higher, and then when I start getting my leak, then I can designate where it is. And then you simply have to remove those tiles and those, those stone in those areas, 
and check the underlayment because what will happen sometimes that underlayment will tear from that movement will tear um, and then you just put some new underlayment on it, put your towel back and that should fix it. Yeah, you have what's called a sl in slate, you have what's called a slate ripper and I was going to bring, I, I didn't know how much I wanted me to bring, but um, there's a slate ripper that actually slides underneath the saw and you hammer it out and you take the nails out and then that towel slides down and then when you do a repair, you want to do it correctly. I don't like using copper tabs. I just don't think that 16 ounce copper is strong enough and I think sometimes it risks fall. They make stainless steel hooks designed for doing repairs with slate. Um, I recommend that very highly using some type of stainless steel hook or something like that or a nail pattern where they put a piece of metal, put a nail in the middle of it and they put it up in there and they nail it off and then slide a piece of metal to protect it from you know leaking as well. So there's a couple of good and there's a National Slate Association which I'm a member of um, and they have a great book um, and you can get off the internet um, that it tells you, you know how to repair slate and things of that nature. And there's some great YouTube videos out there on repairing slate as well. Uh, but tiles the same way. In fact, we um, involved in a project for uh, Christian Brothers after the storm. Um, now, I recommended and wanted to fight for them to get that roof relayed. In other words, take all that Spanish tile off and do the underlayment because I felt there was a lot of racking going on, so to your point. So, but, but there were. There were a lot of racking going on, in my opinion. I saw a lot of shifting, um, but they didn't want to fight it. They, they were happy with what we had gotten from the insurance company. So I went back and had a real scope of work to simply do repair work on it. And so we removed a lot of slate, put some new underlayment underneath there, and nailed it back down. So do you recommend, uh, instead of removing, um, a roofer recommend an independent inspector to, to help diagnose you know, where the leaks? You can, they got some great, in fact, I got a meeting tomorrow, you got some great um, um, guys, I don't know who the names, they got the name Steve Brocke, who is an architect and, a, and an expert in, in roofing as well. Uh, Mike um, is another guy, is a friend of mine that, that I work with um, from time to time. So there's a few um, in, in the area that are roof, registered roof observers, you know, as consultants. Again, like I said, you know, if you have a home in the French Quarter, it's, it's an expensive proposition. So, and I tell people all the time, look, if you don't trust me, I don't want you to do business with me. I really don't because it's that expensive and my reputation is more important to me than, you know, dealing, than dealing with someone who's kind of... I don't, you know, and that's fine. I'll recommend someone. But you got a lot of great roofers out there. You got some not so good ones too, but you got a lot of great roofers out there. What could you say about the interface between the roofing and the power kits? That always seems to be a vulnerable area. And I know there's a lot of DCC um, specification uh, in terms of capping that or not capping it. I like what I like to do, but I don't know. I can't tell you. But, but, no, but the, typically um, it's costly, but you can. You no, know, you, if you want to do it right, you really need a stone mason. And there's some good ones too, you know, and there's some bad ones. They're not as many good stone masons as you like, but there's some projects I saw go around that they did a super job on, on the stone, you know, parapet cap, um, um, new, you know, just redoing it and refacing it. Um, and it's something that's lasted, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and it's been there. The biggest, you know, we're the biggest sinking city in the world, you know, because you know, we're built on swamps and they pump the water out to keep us, give us land, but it continues to sink. Um, over the years and of course those buildings shift and things of that nature um, but yeah yet it's a big no-no to put parapet caps on top of a stone cap but if guys want to do a quick fix easy you know that's the way to do it it's just it's expensive to own property in a quarter I mean there's no two ways about it <laughs> oh also too guys and just to uh, let you know this is kind of off the cuff but and built up roofing this is a great little product um, it's called um, green slope it's made by a company called Viking Products. And basically, it's a mixture of um, vermiculite and some um, uh, poly, uh, polystyrene foam in there. And they mix it with the urethane. It allows you to almost like a, like a Play-Doh consistency to create water diverters. And then you can cover it up with a membrane or coat it to move ponding water from one area to another. So that's a great little lightweight product um, that you can use and sometimes it gets a little rough in the quarters trying to move that water to a different location um, for that. So that's a great product. So there are some unique new products out there to help the problems that we do with seeing here.